<laughs> Thank you so much um, for those engaging and insightful presentations. Um, we have about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A, but before I kind of pass around the mic, I want to flag a few things that our presenter said maybe we could bring this up in Q&A. So if we want to come back to those or circle back to them at the end if we have time, or you could catch them later um, and pick their brains. Um, so questions about limited social capital and how you manage that. Um, how you translate your research to contexts outside the U.S. And then also managing your mentors. And I kind of want to like sneakily add to the end of that. I'm curious about managing your mentors when you're no longer a grad student. Because we still need mentors even when you're faculty, I assume. Um, so those are just want to flag those if anyone's like, yes, I want to know. Um, and I also want to remind people asking questions to please use the microphone. Um, so questions. Clarifying question for you: What is meant by limited limited social capital? Because I think that's something. I'm right <coughs> Certainly. So, I mean, I brought, I think if I remember correctly, you brought that up in your presentation. So, I'm going to pass this along. Um. So, when I first began as an assistant professor, I really I felt like I had to say yes to everything. Um, because I, I felt like everything, you know, tenure mattered, and if I didn't say everything, then that would be a problem. And I very re quickly realized that that, that was completely untenable. Um, 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 I realized that, um, as I talked about in my, in my talk, that, 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 that daily work was going to be pivotal for getting the book done, which was the requirement for tenure, frankly. not rewriting the language exam twice, which I did do. <laughs> um, um, so, um, so for me, it was about figuring out how to be a good colleague, a great colleague, how to be a good mentor to my undergraduate and graduate students. Um, at the same time, that, uh, and also being, being diplomatic, actually. Um, so one thing that I did that actually helped on the front end is I, I had a lot of coffees with my colleagues and I kind of I developed relationships with them actually. Um, and I just sought them out, right? Um, and it sometimes meant that they would ask me to do stuff, but it also meant that um, that if they approached me with a task, I could say to them, you know what? Right now I'm really focused on the book manuscript and I, I have this goal that I want to accomplish uh, right now, this chapter with them. So, so right now is really not a great time for me to uh, take on the third revision of the language exam. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, uh, you know, but maybe, you know, in a few years. So that was one thing that I did. Um, um, I also used my mentors sometimes to help me, right? Um, informal and formal mentors. So if something came up that really wasn't um, a wise use of my time, and also figuring out was a wise use of my time, I would you know approach an informal and or informal mentor and say, you know, what do you think about this? Um, and if it really was something that I could that I if it was not something I could handle myself, then there was a way in which my mentor, and that happened very very rarely, if it was that important, could kind of have a a, a water cooler moment. Um, hi, so thank you for the panel. It was exciting, really interesting. Um, I actually had a question for Minao. If um, you mentioned having to deal with imposter syndrome, and I mean, of course, I'm sure anyone else can speak to this too. But what um, do you, do you have any like recommendations for methods or things that you found particularly useful in dealing with imposter syndrome, overcoming it, or just managing it? Well, maybe we should all talk about it. Okay. Um, I mean, I shared some of those methods um, in my talk, but for me, even like having the, the phrase, like a diagnosis, was really helpful, um, um, and so that was useful. Um, but you know, one of the things that I really loved about Michigan um, once I got once I got to the department um, was was really kind of how easy it was to talk to my fellow graduate students. I mean, I, you know, I've been in a couple different departments these days, and, and not all departments are, um, not, some departments 
graduate students feel very, very competitive with each other, very competitive with each other, and that makes those kinds of dialogues really difficult. So for me, ultimately, being able to have conversations um, I, you know, with, with people, uh, I didn't use the term misfit, right? You can't. I didn't use the term misfit, but finding those communities, and for me, it was outside the department. Um, that, that was what, sorry, that was where I found communities of people who I could relate to, people who were um, the children of immigrants. I don't know, but I was—I felt like the only one. Um, people who were first-gen students, like for me, that 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 occurred outside the department, um, and I found my way back to the department through um, 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 ultimately. But everybody has a personal story for dealing with imposter syndrome. For me, for me, it was really a personal competition. I mean, I think because this is. Um, so this is something, so at Stanford we talk a lot about students who feel they're the admissions mistake, right? <laughs> like I must be the admissions mistake. So um, it's also to normalize that, that lots of people, so if lots of people feel that way, then it's actually, and so in that sense, going back to this thing about what, how we can help one another, I think occasionally talking about it like, oh, I feel, this will allow, opens up a space for other people also to express their vulnerability. So a part of what it is, is changing this culture around seeming like you understand it all. Knowing that there are other people who feel vulnerable, I think opening, as scary as it can be, sometimes opening up that space means that, you know. Yeah, I would just join that and say that I recall my first semester here after being out of school for five years, just writing down all the words that people were saying that I did not know, right? right? And, and I wouldn't have admitted to the other people in the room that I didn't have that vocabulary. Um, but I think, you know, as you were saying, that normalizing it is so essential. And I also didn't hear of this term until after graduate school, and I realized, oh, that's what I felt. <laughs> and, and so many people feel that. And then I realized, as I started talking with friends and colleagues, that they had felt that in some fashion to, to one degree or another. And I think making it more visible and, and, and less stigmatizing, right, to admit one's weaknesses or vulnerabilities or perceived because often they're not accurate, right? Like oftentimes you would say that to somebody and they'd be like, no, but you were great in class today and you know, whatever it may be, I imagine. So, that'd be my input. Oh, God, oh, 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 oh. It's just really quick because I want to give a shout out to Emily Rose who's now at UC Davis, I think. I remember in Vita Chen's seminar, she once said, you know what? I don't know what this is. I, I, she, she said, I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> and I was like, it was this, like revelation. And so I started doing that a lot. And it actually, it backfires still yeah. sometimes, but for me, it was just like, ah, yeah. amazing light bulb. <laughs> um, and I think part of it, too, is, it, well, your story of incredible tenacity, like just showing up and, you know, like, our culture, especially for women, <coughs> aging is considered to be a bad thing, right? But like, I have actually learned a lot as I've gotten older. <laughs> I had I had lunch with a with a U of R um, graduate who is now in a tenure track job, and she has a call. She has a, sh a shitty colleague, basically, who's being mean to her and other people. And she was like, what do I do? You know, should I quit my job? And I was like, no, <laughs> you're not going to quit your job. You worked so hard to get this job. And so we had we talked about it over lunch. And she said, well, how did you, how did you get to this point? And it's like, well, you know, I've been doing it for nine years now. Bad things, you know, sometimes bad things have happened to me. And, and you you move on, you know, or you, you get strategies, you start to realize, like, you know, most most of the people I work with are delightful and, and uh, you know, really enjoy it. There's some bad actors in any organization, right? So you, 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 know. do, you start to know who they are, and then you can kind of develop strategies for how you're going to maybe preempt them in certain faculty meetings. Um, stuff like that, but <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm worried about your question because when I go to Council of Chairs, okay, that's the Institute Council, so all of the department chairs across the Institute of RIT go, and our provost is a woman now, which is a big deal. She's an out lesbian woman. It's amazing, um, and that's one thing I'm grateful for Dave Munson, for to our new um, Michigan Dean of Engineering, who's now our new president at RIT, that he picked. Alan, it's a big deal. 
but still, they're like Ellen. There's like Ellen and like four other women in this room of like 60 people. You know, <coughs> so I definitely feel imposter syndrome sometime. But I tell myself, you know, my department voted me into this position. You know, maybe they didn't have a million choices, but still. <laughs> <laughs> My team believes I can do it, you know, and, and so I just tell them when I have, when I feel like I have to speak up for the interests of my faculty, I do it, you know, even if I'm kind of nervous because there's all these people that, you know, maybe don't understand humanities or seem a little hostile or whatever. Um, and they actually, they appreciate it too. Um, so, you know, just trying to like push yourself and put you know, put yourself out there and it gets easier, I think, mm -hmm. over time. Um, hi guys. Um, first of all, thank you so, so much for these wonderful talks, for your vulnerability, your honesty, for your advice. Um, I know myself and others are extremely grateful. Um, I have a somewhat controversial question <laughs> and I want to say that it's we're like deeply grounded in gratitude for this opportunity and for this conference um, because I never thought like when I started in history program here that I would attend a conference in a history department where every single panel had a woman of color. Like I didn't think that that was ever going to happen. Um, my first day in the history department, I sat down at the breakfast and it was a sea of white dudes and me and my advisor. And like, I was really scared. Um, and I, so I, I wanna say that my, my question is, is rooted in gratitude for this experience. Um, but I guess I, I'm curious about what you all think about the fact that um, our, our conversations about career diversity and, you know, experiencing something other than the tenure track, the typical, has centered women, has centered people of color, and that that is the audience who's predominantly here today. Um, what does it mean about history as a field, as a department, um, and what things potentially need to change within those departments? Uh, in order to make it such that this is something that everyone is considering, and how do we, like, like basically, like causality or or um, correlation, like, is it just such that mostly women and people of color end up outside of or doing things that speak to other audiences, or is it such that the field is hostile to these these folks, um, and and what does that mean for all of us in this room? In my experience, um, white men are worried about the job market too, and, and are, you know, <laughs> are looking into you know like the, like the grad students at U of R that I you know the, like one of them got I've, I've written him so many letters this fall, and um, he's really nervous about getting a job, and I I really feel for him. Um, I do think sometimes women will put their partner's career like. Uh, it's not always the case, but sometimes women are, are balancing um, concerns about their their partner's career. And, you know, we, we haven't talked about this, but this could be uh, something else you could ask us about. A lot of us are mothers, mm -hmm. and that that's relevant, too, is, like, thinking about, you know, um, how many kids you want to have and how, like, I was 37 when I got pregnant. I don't recommend waiting any longer than that. Um, that you know. So um, anyway, so I, I I think some of it is maybe not causation, um, but it it can be the case that what looks like authoritative. So when someone when someone is speaking, they may be perceived as authoritative. You know, if they're so Dave Munson, our president, he's six six. He's literally, you know, very, a very very tall man, and that, and he's white, and that carry he carries a certain physical presence, right? And we're all embodied. So I do think, you know, it can be challenged. Those are additional challenges that women and people of color can face when interviewing: is how to how to be perceived as authoritative, um, and I think that can influence people's um, success on the job market. Um, but there's, there's, um, you know, I, I don't think it's the case that it's only women and people of color that should be thinking about, you know, how can I do work that I find meaningful? 
how can I create a career um, that feels right for me? I don't know, what, what do other people think? You're looking at me. All right. Um, <laughs> I, so one of the things that's really interesting is when I was hired at Lafayette, we had a department of 11, and I was the second woman and the first mom to get tenure there. Like, and this is, um, you know, in 2007 and then eventually 2013. And coming from Michigan, where the faculty ratio seemed to me to be about half and half, and I had these amazing female um, role models, I was kind of shocked. I mean, my first week of classes, one of my um, now happily retired colleague said, oh, you look like a busy little girl. And I thought, oh, 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 oh. am I? Somebody else had the little girl comment yesterday. I shared that as well. Um, so I think that there are, obviously, we're historians, right? The legacies of inequalities in the past, the legacies of who is considered an intellectual, who is considered worthy of listening to or giving a stage and on what opportunities, what is the hierarchy of knowledge within the academy if research is considered the thing we should all be aspiring to, then those of us who also are at, say, a teaching institution or do publicly facing work, you know, like, are considered maybe not, um, or at least in our generation, we're not considered to be the ones who are, like, the grads you want to put on the poster, right? We're all being invited back now, but it's, it's not necessarily, you know, always been the people who are, are historically being celebrated, but I think it's also kind of where you look for validation. And I, I think that one of the things that's been so encouraging about this moment and this space is that one of the big points has been validation isn't only within the academy, it's also outside of it, right? And it's also like making those connections with these different communities in ways that I have found so inspiring hearing all the speakers talk about, right? Um, and so, you know, maybe our, our being represented more as women and, and people of color in this space is also about a, a certain relationship to the community and, and sharing knowledge back and forth um, among that demographic. Um, but I welcome other thoughts on that. It's, that's a great question. <coughs> so I, I would take this question, I, I'll sort of approach it from a slightly different or a kind of flip perspective. So when I was deciding whether to leave Carleton, one of the hardest things was students who said to me, there are not many women of color on this campus. How can you leave a faculty position, right? And honestly, of all, <laughs> including my mom's anxiety about my employment situation, uh, this was the <laughs> hardest thing to hear. And I don't have a good answer, and I don't, you know, this is hard. But it's also not fair, like all the other burdens, to say the burden of representation at the cost of your own happiness it should also always be borne by you. Right? Yeah. So this is a hard question. I, there's no easy answer because it is historically rooted in these long histories of, you know, I wouldn't feel this way if the campus had looked different, right? I wouldn't feel this burden. But it's also true the campus doesn't. I mean, both things are true. And so it was a hard decision. I will not say it was an easy decision. It is, of all the things, one of the things I return to because some of those students have stayed in touch. They've done wonderful things, but I do think about it. It is, it was one of the, that was maybe the hardest part of leaving that job, I think, for me personally. Can I say something about yeah. the question? Because um, I think also um, maybe the people who put the conference together uh, maybe people who put the conference together had this idea that it would be important to center the voices of uh, women of color and and um, you know that could be a possibility. <laughs> but also, um, just the other day, I got an email from some list service like radical historians or something like that, and they were asking people to take a pledge to say we will not participate in conferences that allow all white panels or all male panels. Um, I don't know if anybody else got that email, but I thought, okay, yeah, we won't go to conferences like our professional conferences that, that we go to, um, things that people put together in our departments even um, on our campus. It's like, I can't remember how, I can't tell you how many times I've had to have conversations with faculty members putting together, you know, panels for a conference that our center is sponsoring, like, that's not okay, you know? So I believe that's all the time we have for this panel, unfortunately. <laughs> um, <laughs>